You're going to have yourself an IV line. Okay, that looks like this. Okay, I don't have one with me. I mean, I have one there, but I don't have one to actually show you because it's already connected. But you have an IV line. You have a plastic, plastic tip at this end, which is this. Okay, and this is what you connect into your contrast. Okay, remember how we opened this up? A small vial and there was a, a rubber stopper on this one. This also is going to have a rubber stopper. Okay, when we remove that, it's going to be a stopper and we're going to puncture it with this plastic, plastic uh, pointed edge into the bottle. It can also be pierced into a bag like so. Okay, contrast comes in various forms. It can come in a bottle, it can come in a bag. Okay, but we're gonna take the, here you go. Here's the spike then. Okay, we're just going to put it in. Make sure it's nice and sealed. All right. There's a lot of floaties in here, by the way. Am I gonna put this in my patient? No. Okay. It's Right. So this line, does it have air? It does have air, right? So we need to purge the air out before we connect this to our patient. So it's still dim in here, huh? Is it dim in here or is it just me? I think it's just you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, so I have a pole here, but I'm going to put it right here for, so you guys can see it better, okay? So we need to get rid of the air. So to get rid of the air, I'm going to let this run a little bit. So I'm going to unclamp it. There's a couple places here to unclamp. There. See how it's dripping? Well, why isn't it dripping? Because you're up. Up where? Point it up. I'm the... up above the bag. Yeah. If it's below the bag, look what happens. If I'm above the bag, it stops. So this is how you purge it. You let it run, and you can control the flow by changing the level of, or the height of your IV. Okay. Once I've purged up all the air, what I'm going to do here is fluid on fluid. What am I doing? Then it connects, <coughs> and I'm good. It's actually dripping. It's good to go. Is it um, okay to do it like you did right now, how you were purging it and then connect it? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. But be before, but make sure the doctor's there. <coughs> don't push the con. Don't have the contrast blowing until the doctor says it's okay, so you want to lock it, but you can connect it, but make sure it's fluid on fluid, and then you can lock it so nothing's flowing in until the doctor is there to observe the contrast going in the patient, okay? I just showed you guys the drip fusion method. That's the drip fusion method. Drip infusion, okay? Drip infusion, what's drip infusion? Are we talking about large amount, short time, or large amount, short time? Shorter time. I'm sorry. Long time. Did I say short twice? I know. Okay. So large amount, longer duration. This is the infusion method. Okay. Last method. Okay. This is known as the. God, I swear it's dark in here. All right. I forgot to say so. All right, next one here is the piggyback, the piggyback. All it is is that I am not storing a line here. Patient is already coming down with an IV line. They may be coming down with some kind of medication already going in through their IV line. They got an existing IV line. Do I need to start one up? No. There's already one in there. Why should I start one up? I'm going to use the existing one. So when you guys are looking <coughs> at these lines, they have all these, here's, they have what's known as side ports. Here's a side port, here's a side port. Okay? What I'm going to do is the same thing. I think I used up all my fluids. 
Okay, so I'm gonna get some more. Remember, single use only. So I got more fluids. Okay, I'm purging the air out. Okay, so piggyback method. You guys watching? It's already existing. I'm just gonna connect to one of my side ports. Okay, it also has a lure lock and a valve. I'm going to <coughs> clamp off the main line because when you're injecting through, you don't want the contrast going back into the person's uh, IV bag. Okay, so we're going to clamp the main line off so that when you inject, it's going to go straight into the patient's vein. <coughs> okay, I'm going to clamp this off manually. Here, can you guys see that? Okay, that's piggyback. I just connected my line into the existing line. Piggyback. That's all it is. Oh, there are some other ports they have it so that you can inject it. Is it because I've seen it? They you can use any port that you want, but you want to be careful because remember, when I'm injecting through, what am I doing with the main line? Clamping. I'm clamping it off. Make sure that this medication they came down with isn't some kind of life-sustaining medication. Because if you clamp this off, you can what? Kill them. You can kill them. <laughs> They're gonna die. So what happens if it is a life-sustaining? Do you have to insert your If it's life-sustaining, then you leave that alone. And start you your insert your own. You start another one. Okay. Okay? Another thing, hold on. Another thing that you want to consider is that you are, that whatever you got going through there is compatible with what you're using because you don't want to mix up anything that's not compatible okay yes so whenever you do a piggyback are you going to be using the direct push method yeah you can also yes yeah, so the question piggyback. is yeah piggyback you can use direct push or you can hook up another line to okay. it and drip and fuse it okay so yes. either one either one okay got it do you consider if you mix the medication with the, the IV, may uh -huh. IV, is it still a the piggyback? It's still a piggyback. If you add it to the container, that container. If I put medication in here, right. you wouldn't do that. You're talking about putting something in here to mix it up? Yeah. No, you wouldn't do that. That's not within your scope. Okay. Yeah. I, I know you see nurses and doctors yeah. doing that, putting medication on existing lines. Yeah, we don't do that. Not only that, but it's because when you start mixing up contrast in there, now the contrast becomes diluted. It changes the concentration. Yeah, but we don't do that. All right, any questions? Okay. I swear it's dark in here. Okay. Selection of venipuncture. Is, is that okay with my props up there? Is it messing up your the slides or can I leave it up there? Okay. Selection of venipuncture sites. The most frequently used veins for venipuncture are the superficial, superficial veins in the forearm in the, and the hand. Forearm and the hand. Okay. We don't do fingers. We don't, I mean, we have some veins in there, but we don't do that. It's stupid. Okay. <laughs> we got veins in our hands. Okay, we've got veins in our wrist, we've got veins in our forearm, our elbow, and then the upper arm. Okay, we go from here to here. That is our scope of practice. Okay, we can't stick anything else. <coughs> the larger medium cubital, this is also known as the anticubital, the anticubital vein. And the cephalic veins of the upper forearm are used the most often. I've got a slide to show you those veins. The other veins, back of your hand, your forearm. Have you guys ever been stuck in the hand or the forearm? Mm -hmm. It hurts. So we avoid that as much as possible. But if that's your only choice, then we're going to stick the hand or the forearm. Okay? But avoid that as, at all costs, as much as possible. What we're going to stick is the crease of your elbow. This is where the cubital or the antecubital and cephalic veins are located. This is the best area to stick. If you have good veins, of course, right? If you have good veins. <coughs> you as a technologist is going to depend on 
feel, which is touch, touch and feel, and also sight. You should be able to see the veins. If you don't see the veins, you can actually, but you can see the flow of blood. Okay, they may not be raised, but you can still see the vein based on the color on that particular part of the skin. <clears throat> and you also go by feel. The vein should feel bouncy to the touch. This should have a bounce to it. If it's hard, if it's coarse, you don't want to touch that because that usually means it is a thrombosed or blocked vein. You're not going to get anything through that. Okay, so good healthy vein must be bouncy to the touch. Okay. <coughs> Putting on a tourniquet. The tourniquet is going to be placed slightly above the area of the access slightly above the axis. So if I'm doing a wrist or a hand, I'm going to tie the tourniquet around here. The whole purpose of putting a tourniquet causes your veins to plump up. Okay? What we're also going to do is probably pump the fist a few times to cause the veins to be even more prominent. Okay? Because we're increasing venous pressure in there. What's also good to do is and this is what I advise my students when we're doing venipuncture class is that don't show up to class dehydrated. I want you to be hydrated. Why do we want you guys to be hydrated when you're getting when you're getting stuck with a needle? Easier to pull blood. Why is it easier? More watery. More watery, right? Because the main media for your blood cells is water. Okay? So we want you to be uh, <coughs> hydrated. Full of fluids. All right. <clears throat> so here is a picture of my arm. No. I'm so funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's a picture of someone else's arm. This is the good vein right here. It runs from across the forearm and into the basilic veins over here. This is the, this is the uh, cubital or anti-cubital, median cubital or the anti-cubital area, okay? This is the one that we like to stick the most, okay? But don't get excited about seeing beans like that. Okay? Not only is it rare, but when you try to stick it, what do they want to do? They want to do this, okay? They want to move around and then wiggle, okay? So sometimes they're good, but they can also be a challenge. All right. <laughs> Considerations of vein selection. Okay, number one is the type of therapy that you're going to administer. The same arm should not be accessed twice for an IV at the same time. If at all possible, try to start a line in the patient's opposite arm. <clears throat> Sites access above an IV, if there's an existing IV, in place will be diluted with the solution of an IV that's already going in there. So again, if the patient's coming down with an IV, try to go on the opposite arm, okay? Mastectomies. Do not perform venipuncture from the arm on the side at which a mastectomy has been performed. A mastectomy causes lymphostasis. lymphostasis. The lymph vessels themselves are not flowing, okay? So the vessels become occluded and what happens is the arm becomes very, uh, very swollen, okay? Not only is it hard to find a vein, but because it's swollen, it's gonna be painful to access a vein. Third part of this is that, is lymph involved with uh, fighting infections? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you don't have the lymph flowing through there and you stick that arm, are the chances of them getting an infection on that site great? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So avoid sites, uh, sites in which a mastectomy has occurred. Hematoma. A venipuncture performed in an area of a hematoma is also painful. So tr tr avoid sticking that site. Stick away from there or stick the opposite arm. Scar tissue. Someone who's been stuck over and over and over again. Okay, whether they've been hospitalized and they've been many times, or if you've got an IV drug user, there's gonna be some scar tissue in that site of injection. So it's gonna be very tough to penetrate that skin. It can also be very painful. Fistulas, 
You guys know what fistulas are? Yes. Or dialysis. Okay. Fistulas, yes, are related to <coughs> dialysis. I'm not talking about the literal, literal term of fistula in which is a communication between uh, an opening in two adjacent uh, tissues or organs. A fistula here in this case is that, for instance, you are uh, patients into renal or re near renal failure. In other words, your kidneys are not operating, so they need to get dialyzed. They need to be put in a machine to remove the blood from your body, filter it, and put it back into your body. But in order to be hooked up to one of these dialysis machines, you got to have a fistula that's been operated, uh, surgically inserted into, usually it's in the upper extremity. And the way you recognize a fistula, okay, doesn't look like this. They look like they have some great veins, but they're probably gonna be two or three times greater in diameter than what you see there. They're huge. <clears throat> and what those are, there are um, they're artificial tubes, artificial grafts that have been inserted in the patient's arm, okay? Then they go to a dialysis. They get hooked up with two different needles, one to take blood out, goes into the machine, and then one to pump back the filter, uh, to put the fil uh, filtered blood back into to your body. Is okay. it the same pick line? Huh? Is it the pick line you're talking about? It's not a pick line. It's, it's inside. It's actually been surgically placed. They're surgical, surgical, uh, they're tubes that have been surgically placed inside. Not a pick. pick line is just an IV. A fistula, again, looks kind of like this, okay, but it's two to three times thicker. It's not invisible then? It's not it's invisible. Not invisible. It pops out. It pops out. But the warning here is you don't want to stick that, okay? Because if you do, it's a high pressure system. And even if you stick the venous part of that fistula, at 20 to 25 feet away, you're still gonna get hit with that blood. It squirts out, it squirts out. So you don't want to stick that. Okay. Edematous arms or thrombos. Okay, thrombos, again, if it's coarse, hard, don't stick it because it's probably occluded. Edematous, it just means arm swelling. Hard to find a vein, but again, because of the swelling, it can be painful. So if you've got a, an edematous arm, go to the other arm. Um, oh, here's a question. What if both arms are edematous? Or what if the patient had bilateral mastectomy? What are you going to do now? What is our scope of practice? We're going to do it on the kids. On the legs? You can only do extremities. But if you got mastectomy on both sides, you're now out of two arms. So who are you going to, who are you going to enlist? For you going, we can't do that, right? Yes. So we get a nurse or a doctor to stick somewhere else. Okay? Subclavian, so maybe the legs. Okay? Maybe the neck. So we can still administer the, the drug there. We just can't. We just can't. You can't access it. Yes. Access. Once it gets accessed, then you can, you can administer, administer it. But we can't access it. But you can't access it. We only have access upper extremity. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, where am I going here? All right. So consideration uh, hematoma. We talked about hematomas. Okay. Avoid hematomas. Oh. Blood transfusion, whenever possible, perform venipuncture on the opposite arm of blood transfusion sites. Burned area, do not perform venipuncture in burned area. Not only is it sensitive and painful, but what happens to a burned area? Infection. Okay. Yeah, infection. That part of that area is highly susceptible to infections. So you want to avoid that area altogether. Okay? All right. Uh, okay, step by step, venipuncture procedure. <clears throat> Aseptic technique, right? So you're going to wash your hands. What's the next thing you're going to do? Put gloves on. Okay, put gloves on. Okay, but you don't put gloves on until the tourniquet's been put on and you set up all your equipment because doing all that with gloves on becomes very cumbersome to do. 
So the whole purpose of the glove is to protect you from blood-borne pathogens, right? So you can set up your equipment, and once the tourniquet is put on, then you can put on your gloves, okay? Examine the extremity, especially flat planes. Try to allow the patient the most mobility if feasible. You're going to leave the patient's dominant hand free. So in other words, you're going to stick the non-dominant arm. So if you're right-handed, you're going to stick the left side. Okay? What do I tell people to do? I tell them to stick the dominant arm. Why? Prevents it from moving? Not only that, no. It's going to be more muscular and probably have the better veins. Right? Because it's your dominant arm. It's the arm that you use most. Okay? <coughs> so I tell people, just go ahead and stick the dominant arm. That's just me, okay? Um, number three, it is preferable to select the most distal site in which the needle can be accommodated. What that means is the most distal part of the arm or the vessel that the needle can accommodate. So here is there's a vessel, okay? If I'm going to go in with a needle, okay, I am going to take the path in which it is most direct. So I am going to go this way. I'm not going to go this way because if the needle's too long, what's going to happen? I'm going to puncture the vein. So you want to go to the most distal part of the vein in which the needle can be accommodated. Okay. That's what it means, okay? If you have a curve, I'm gonna stick here and not here. If I stick here, it goes right through the vein. If I stick here, it can be accommodated, okay? Sense, make sense? <coughs> All right. Oh. <coughs> Uh, okay, clip the hair free of, uh, clip the area free of hair if necessary. Remember hair harbors what? Yes. Microorganisms, so we want to get rid of hair if possible. If possible, okay? Not a lot of people do. Ascertain if there is satisfactory distension of the vein. Snuggly, <coughs> apply the tourniquet approximately two to six inches above the intended entrance site. Again, so if you're doing hand, Wrist, okay? If you're doing forearm, tourniquet around here. If you're doing elbow, tourniquet up here, okay? <coughs> Instruct the patient to open and close their fist several times. Lightly tap to, uh, lightly tight the vein to increase uh, dilatation, <coughs> making visibility of the vein, vein better. Cleanse the site with a swab of alcohol, applying friction in a circular motion from the center to the periphery, covering an area of approximately two inches in diameter. Again, allow to dry, don't blow, don't fan. <coughs> if so, if necessary, if you, have someone's, uh, if you have someone who has a vein that moves around, who's wearing short sleeves? You wear short sleeves? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so number 10, it says anchor the vein with your non-dominant hand to thumb to prevent movement. Okay, let's come on, come on, come on. It's not weird. Hey, give me your arm. Okay, see your vein? Unless she has veins there somewhere, okay? <laughs> if you have a vein and you're accessing it and it moves around, okay, I'm gonna hold you with this, okay? I'm gonna take my non-dominant hand because I'm gonna have my needle here on my right hand. To prevent the vein from moving, I'm gonna make the skin taut by using my thumb and pulling on the skin or the vein so that when I stick it, it doesn't move. If I stick it, look how it likes to move around, okay? If I make it taut, you see anything moving? Sorry, I'm scratching me. <laughs> Same thing here, if you were gonna stick the arm here, you're gonna pull on the skin to make it nice and taut. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hope it didn't hurt you. No, you're good. Okay. So you're going to anchor the vein. You're, so once the needle goes in, you're going to insert the needle of choice through the skin at approximately 
20 to 45 degrees, okay? You're gonna go through the skin. <coughs> and then when, and this is true, when you hit the vein, you're actually gonna feel it pop. You're gonna feel it pop and then you're gonna decrease your angle because let's say here's the vein. If you're going 20 to 45, okay, and you go all the way through, what's gonna happen? You're gonna go all the way through the vein. So once you go in, change your angle and then insert it just a couple more <coughs> centimeters into the vein, okay? I'm gonna skip this for a little bit. Once you get access, release the tourniquet, <coughs> connect the desired infusion method, secure the device in place with tape, administer the contrast, and then you're done. Go wash your hands and do your, your nursing stuff. Okay? Proper entry of venipuncture needles. So again, you're gonna go about 20, it says 15 here, 20 to 45 degrees. Okay, oh, 20 to 45. Once you've got in, you're gonna lower it to almost go <coughs> parallel with the vessel. <coughs> Some common problems with needle insertion. Number one, <coughs> number one, number A, letter A. Is the correct insertion technique. Remember the bevel tip of the, the needle. It has a bevel tip to it. You want that bevel edge or tip to face upwards. Okay, that's common practice. It's just a lot, it's, it's a lot easier to also see the, the needle going in into the skin as you penetrate it. So bevel up, this is the correct way. If you are going around a curved vein, you may be in because, but the bell is up, it's pressed up against the vessel wall. Are you gonna get blood, in, blood return? Probably not, so pull it back just a little bit. You don't wanna go any further because if you go any further, what's gonna happen? Puncturing through. You're gonna puncture, you're gonna puncture the, the vein. This is how you also get a hematoma. <coughs> if the bevel was facing down, now you're on the bottom wall of the vessel, okay? Uh, D, this is what happens when you go too far. E, this is where we're talking about infiltrate, where the bevel is halfway in the vessel and some of it is sticking out. So when you inject the contrast, some of it may be going into the vessel, but it's also going <coughs> into the surrounding tissue, right? And also the opposite, blood. Because you're halfway in, halfway out, you may have blood leaking into that uh, out of that site and going also under the uh, surrounding tissue, causing what's, what was that word? Hematoma. Hematoma. Okay. And the last one here is collapse. It just collapses. All of a sudden, it just goes really frigid and it just collapses. There's nothing you can do about that. Find another vein and stick it. That easy. How would you know if it collapsed? You get no blood return. Or? You just get no blood return. You're just like, oh, I'm an, I know I'm on the right spot, but nothing's happening. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? Okay. Last last few slides. Complications <coughs> with IV injections. We talked about infiltration. Infiltration and phlebitis are the two most common complications of IV therapy. Preventing phlebitis or inflammation of the vein walls can be difficult since there are many tissue irritating drugs that can be used. Reducing the occurrence of phlebitis is by inspecting the site regularly. So again, if you're having somebody who has a drip infusion, okay, so they're getting infused with a drip, regularly check the site to make sure that there isn't any type of redness going on making sure that there is any infiltration going on. When you're doing the direct push method, you'll see it infiltrate right away. You'll just see the skin just pop up and you're like, oh damn, okay, <laughs> sorry about that, okay? But when it's infusing, you don't see it right away. So when that occurs, you need to stop what you're doing, okay? So reducing the occurrence of phlebitis is by inspecting the site regularly, changing the IV at the first site of tenderness or redness or warmth. Phlebitis can also be reduced by using the largest possible gauge, okay? Is that a large diameter or small diameter? Small. Small diameter. Smaller sizes will allow better blood flow. 
around the cannula, then that's the needle, with, uh, within the vein and decrease irritation. To detect infiltration, again, you want to expect the site often for characteristics of uh, signs of cold, pallor, hard area, and decreased flow rate. Because when you got infiltration underneath the, around the injection site under the skin, it's very hard. It's also very painful, you know, and you're feeling for it, and it's like it hurts. And if you hear the patient going, <coughs> ow, 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 okay, is it not a good sign? <laughs> okay. Not to be confused with edema. To detect edema, observe and compare sides of both arms. Edema, <coughs> remember the term edematous we're talking about? Comes from the word edema, okay? Um, edema is excess of watery fluid collecting in the cavities or the tissues of the body. May occur at the insertion site, not because of infiltration, but because maybe the tape, if you look swelling in there, maybe the tape that you put on causes the skin to bunch up. Release the tape and check to see that there is no infiltration or Again, look at both arms to compare edema, because edema is usually on one extremity, not the other. Okay. All right, so make her at insertion site, not because of infiltration, because <coughs> the is too tight. If the site is the problem, you will see diffuse puffiness above, the, uh, above and below the site, rather than a localized edema. So it's a concentrated. <clears throat> okay, while monitoring for signs of infiltration and pulvitis, Watch for changes in flow rate during the injection because infiltration and phlebitis will, will change the flow rate. If you're looking here and all of a sudden it stops dripping, oop, there's something wrong. Or if you're injecting and, it, and you're feeling resistance and the patient's yelling, yelling, stop, it hurts, that's a problem. You need to stop. Okay? But if that's not the problem, then it may be again because they move slightly the lines may have been kinked, okay? Or, have we talked about this earlier, that it sits there for a long period of time, that the, uh, the line itself may become clotted, so of course nothing's going to go through. Or what do you mean, collapse the vein? Or the vein may have collapsed, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of difference, so you've got to learn how to troubleshoot. Okay. All right. It's the last part of it. This is known as the informed consent. Before you begin any of these procedures, it is your responsibility as a technologist to first make sure that you've got the correct patient, the correct procedure, okay? You're giving good history, uh, uh, good explanation of what they're doing, of what you're doing, and an explanation of what's gonna happen